free my children! Oh my god! Ah! No! Conquer, we must stand united! Ah! Oh no! Demonetization. Hello, and welcome back to another installment of Ulpa Gold. Today we are continuing our journey through Star Wars Dark Force Rising by Timothy Zahn, and we are continuing with Chapter 10. It was full dark by the time Kabarak brought the ship to ground in his village, a tight-grouped cluster of huts with brightly lit windows. Do ships land here often? Leia asked as Kabarak pointed the ship toward a shadowy structure, standing apart near the center of the village. In the glare of the landing lights, the shadow became a large cylindrical building with a flat, cone-shaped roof. The circular wall composed of massive vertical wooden pillars, alternating with a lighter, shimmery wood. Just beneath the eaves, she caught a glint of a metal band encircling the entire building. It is not common, Kabarak said, cutting the repulsor lips and running the ship's systems down to standby. Neither is it unheard of. In other words, it was probably going to attract a fair amount of attention. Chewbacca, who had recovered enough for Leia to help into one of the cockpit passenger seats, was obviously thinking along the same lines. The villagers are all close family of the clan Kimba, Kabrak said in answer to Wookiee's slightly slurred question. They all accept my promise of protection as their own. Come. Leia unstrapped and stood up, suppressing a grimace as she did so. But they were here now, and she could only hope that Kabrak's confidence is more than just the unfounded idealism of youth. She helped Chewbacca unstrap, and, and together they followed Nagori back toward the main hatchway, collecting 3PO from her cabin on the way. I must go first, Kabrak said as they reached the exit. By custom, I much appro mm. By custom, I must approach alone to the Duca of the Clan Kimbar upon arrival. By law, I am required to announce out clan visitors to the head of my family. I understand, Leia said, fighting back a fresh surge of uneasiness. She didn't like this business of Kabrak having conversations with his fellow Nogiri that she wasn't in on. Once again, there wasn't a lot she could do about it. We'll wait here until you come and get us. I will be quick, Kabrak promised. He palmed the door at least twice, slipping outside as the panel slid open and then shut again. Chewbacca growled something unintelligible under his breath. He'll be back soon, Leia suits him, making a guess as to what was bothering the Wookiee. I'm certain he is telling the truth, 3 added helpfully. Customs and rituals of this sort are very common among the more socially primitive pre-spaceflight cultures. Except that this culture isn't pre-spaceflight, Leia pointed out her hand playing restlessly with the grip of her lightsaber as she stared at the closed hatchway in front of her. Kabrak could at least have let the door open so they would be able to see when he was coming back. Unless, of course, he didn't want them to see when he was coming back. That is evident, Your Highness. 3 Pure agreed, his voice taking on a professorial tone. I feel certain, however, that their status in that regard has been changed only recent. Well, he broke off as Chewbacca abruptly pushed past him and lumbered back to the center of the ship. Where are you going? Leia called after the Wookiee. His only reply was some comment about the Imperials that she wasn't quite able to catch. Chewie, get back here, she snapped. Kabrak will be back any minute. This time the Wookiee didn't bother to answer. Great, Leia muttered, trying to decide what to do. If Kabrak came back and found Chewbacca gone, but if he came back and found both of them gone. As I was saying, 3PL went on, apparently deciding that the actions of rude Wookiees were better left ignored. All the evidence I have gathered so far about this culture indicates that they were, until recently, a non-spacefaring people. Kabarak's reference to the Duca, obviously a clan center of some sort, the familial and clan structures themselves, plus this whole preoccupation with your perceived royal status. The High Court of Alderaan had a royal hierarchy too, Lay reminded him tartly, still looking back along the empty corridor. No, she decided. She and 3PO better stay here and wait for Kabarak. Most of the people in the galaxy didn't consider us to be socially primitive. No, of course not, 3PO said, sounding a little embarrassed. I didn't mean to imply any such thing. I know, Leia assured him, a little embarrassed herself at jumping on 3PO like that. She'd know what he meant. Where is he anyway? The question had been rhetorical, but even as she voiced it, the hatchway abruptly slid open again. Come, Kabrak said. His dark eyes flicked over Leia and 3PO. Where is the wiki? He went back into the ship, Leia told him. I don't know why. Do you want me to go and find him? Kabrak made a sound halfway between a hiss and a purr. There is no time, he said. The Matrak is waiting. Come. Turning, he started back down the ramp. Any idea how long it will take you to pick up the language? Leia asked GPO as they followed. 
I really cannot say, Your Highness. The droid answered as Kabarak led them across a dirt courtyard past a large wooden building they'd seen on the clan. On the landing, the clan duka, Leia decided. One of the smaller structures beyond it seemed to be their goal. Learning an entirely new language would be difficult indeed, 3 Peel continued. However, if it is similar to any of the six million forms of communication with which I am familiar- I understand, Leia cut him off. They were almost to the lighted building now, and as they approached, a pair of short Naguri standing in the shadows pulled open the double doors for them. Taking a deep breath, Leia followed Kabarak inside. From the amount of light coming through the windows, she would have expected the building's interior to be uncomfortably bright. To her surprise, the room they entered was actually darker than it had been immediately outside. A glance to the side showed why. The brightly lit windows were in fact standard self-powered lighting panels, with the operational sides facing outward. Except for a small amount of spillage from the panels, the interior of the building was lit only by a pair of floating wick lamps. Threepio's assessment of the society echoed through her mind. Apparently he'd know what he was talking about. In the center of the room, standing slightly in a row facing her, were five Naguri. Leia swallowed hard, sensing somehow that the first word should be theirs. Cabra accepted the Naguri in the center and dropped to his knees, ducking his head to the floor and splaying out his hands to his sides. The same gesture of respect, she remembered, that he'd extended to her back in the Kashyyyk holding cell. I lira shmir lak svorilai, he said. Merlai korasiv malarush, vere vedarash. Can you understand it? Leia remembered to 3PO. To a degree, the droid replied. It appears to be a dialect of the ancient trade language. Shea! The Naguri in the center of the line spat. 3PO recoiled. She said quiet. He translated unnecessarily. I understood the gist, Leia said, drawing herself up and bringing the full weight of her royal Alderanian court upbringing to bear on the aliens facing her. Deference to local custom and authority was all well and good, but she was the daughter of their lord Darth Vader, and there were certain discourtesies that such a person should not put up with. Is this how you speak to the Malarouche? she demanded. Six Nagori heads snapped over to look at her. Reaching out with the force, she tried to read the sense behind those gazes. But as always, this particular alien mind seemed totally close to her. She was going to have to play it by ear. I asked a question, she said into the silence. The Nagori in the center took a step forward, and with the motion, Leia noticed for the first time the two small hard bumps on the alien's upper chest beneath the loose tunic. A female? Matriarch, she murmured to 3PL, remembering the word Kabarak had used earlier. A female who is a leader of a local family or sub-clan structure. The droid translated, his voice nervous and almost too low to hear. 3PO hated being yelled at. Thank you, Leia said. I am the Naguri. You're the matriarch of this family? I am she, the Naguri said in a heavily accented but understandable basic. What proof do you offer to your claim of Malarouche? Silently, Leia handed out her hand. The matriarch hesitated, then stepped up to her and gingerly sniffed it. Is it not as I said? Kabarak asked. Be silent, third son, the matriarch said, raising her head to stare into Leia's eyes. I greet you, Lady Vader, but I do not welcome you. Leia held her gaze steadily. She could still not sense anything from any of the aliens, but with her thoughts extended she could tell that Chewbacca had left the ship and was approaching the house, approaching rather rapidly, and with a definite agitation about him. She hoped he wouldn't charge Brashley and ruin what little civility remained here. May I ask why not? she asked the matriarch. Did you serve the Emperor? the other countered. Do you now serve our Lord, the Grand Admiral? No to both questions, Leia told her. Then you bring discord and poison among us, the matrach concluded darkly. Discord between what was and what now is, she shook her head. We do not need more discord on Onogur, Lady Vader. The words were barely out of her mouth when the doors behind Leia swung open again, and Chewbacca strode into the room. The matrach started at the side of the Wookiee, and one of the other Naguri uttered something startle-sounding, but any further reactions were cut off by Chewbacca's snarled warning. Are you sure they're Imperials? Leia asked, a cold fist clutching her heart. No, she pleaded silently. Not now, not yet. The Wookiee growled the obvious, that a pair of Lambda-class shuttles coming from orbit and from the direction of the city of Nicetau could hardly be anything else. And from the direction of the city of Nicetau could be hardly anything else. Kabarak moved up beside the Matrak and said something urgently in his own language. He says he has sworn protection to us, Tripio translated. He asks that the pledge be honored. For a moment, Leia thought the matrach was going to refuse. Then, with a sigh, she bowed her head slightly. Come with me, Kabrak said to Leia, brushing past her and Chewbacca to the door. 
The Matrak has agreed to hide you from my lord, the Grand Admiral, at least for now. Where are we going? Leia asked as they followed him onto the night. Your droid and your analysis equipment I will hide among the Dikon droids that are stored for the night in an outer shed. The Nagori explained, pointing to a windowless building fifty meters away. You and the Wookiee will be more of a problem. If the Imperials have sensor equipment with them, your life sign profiles will register as different from Nogiri. I know, Leia said, searching the sky for the shuttle's running lights, and trying to remember everything she could about life from identification algorithms. Heart rate was one of the parameters she knew, as were ambient atmosphere, respiratory byproducts, and molecular chain EM polarization effects. But the chief long-range parameter was... We need a heat source, she told Kabarak. As big as one as possible. The bakehouse, the Nagori said, pointing to a windowless building three f- down from where they stood. At its back was a squat chimney from which wisps of smoke could be seen curling upward in the backwash of light from the surrounding structures. Sounds like our best chance, Leia agreed. Kabarak, you hide three PO. Chewie, come with me. The Nogri were waiting for them as they stepped from the shuttle. Three females standing side by side, with two children acting as honor wardens by the doors of the Clan Duca building. Thrawn glanced at the group, threw an evaluating sweep around the area, and then turned to Pelion. Wait until the tech team arrives, Captain. He ordered Pelion quickly. Get them started on a check of the communications and countermeasures equipment in the ship over there. Then join me inside. Yes, sir. Thrawn turned to Erkbaum. Dynast. He invited, gesturing at the waiting Naguri. The dynast bowed and strode toward them. Thrawn threw a glance at Ruck, who had taken Urkum's former position at the Grand Admiral's side, and together they followed. There was the usual welcoming ritual, and then the females led the way into the Duca. The shuttle from the Camaro was only a couple of minutes behind them. Pelion briefed the tech team and got them busy, then crossed the Duca and went in. He expected that the Matrak would have managed to round up perhaps a handful of her people for this impromptu late evening visit by their glorious Lord and Master. To his surprise, he found that the old girl had in fact turned out half the village. There was a double row of them, children as well as adults, lining the Duca walls from the huge genealogy wall chart back to the double doors and around again to the mediation booth opposite the chart. Thrawn was seated in the clan high seat two-thirds of the way to the back of the room, with Urkum standing again at his side. The three females who'd met at the shuttle stood facing them, with a second tier of elders another pace back. Standing with the females, his still gray and marked contrast to their older, darker gray, was a young Naguri male. Pelion had apparently missed nothing more important than a smattering of the nonsense ritual the Nagori never seemed to get enough of. As he moved past the silent lines of aliens to stand at Thrawn's other side, the young male stepped forward and knelt before the high seat. I greet you, my lord, he mewed gravely, spreading his arms out to his side. You honor my family in the clan Kimba with your presence here. You may rise, Thrawn told him. You are Kabarak, clan Kimba. I am, my lord. You were once a member of the Imperial Nogiri Commando Team 22, Thrawn said. A team that ceased to exist on the planet Kashyyyk. Tell me what happened. Kabarak might have twitched. Pelion couldn't tell for sure. I filed a report, my lord, immediately upon leaving that world. Yes, I read the report. Thrawn told him coolly. Read it very carefully and noted the questions it left unanswered, such as how and why you survived when all others in your team were killed, and how it was you were able to escape when the entire planet had been alerted to your presence, and why you did not return immediately to either Hanagur or one of our other bases after your failure. This time there was definitely a twitch, possibly a reaction to the word failure. I was left unconscious by the Wookiees during the first attack, Kabarak said. I awakened alone and made my way back to the ship. Once there, I deduced what had happened to the rest of the team from official information sources. I suspect they simply were unprepared for the speed and stealth of my ship when I made my escape. As to my whereabouts afterward, my lord, he hesitated. I transmitted my report and then left for a time to be alone. Why? To think, my lord, and to meditate. Wouldn't Onagur have been a more suitable place for such meditation? Tron asked, waving a hand around the duca. I had much to think about, my lord. For a moment, Tron eyed him thoughtfully. You were slow to respond when the request for a recognition signal came from the surface, he said. 
You then refuse to land at the Nicedow Port Facilities. I did not refuse, my lord. I was never ordered to land there. The distinction is noted, Thrawn said dryly. Tell me why you chose to come here instead. I wished to speak with my matrock, to discuss my meditations with her, and to ask for forgiveness for my failure. And have you done so? Thrawn asked, turning to face the matrock. We have begun, she said in atrociously mangled basic. We have not finished. At the back of the room, the Duke of door swung open, and one of the tech team stepped inside. You have a report, Ensign? Thrawn called to him. Yes, Admiral, the other said, crossing the room and stepping somewhat gingerly around the assembled group of Nuguri elders. We've finished our preliminary set of calm and countermeasures tests, sir, as per orders. Thrawn shifted his gaze to Kabarak. And... We think we've located the malfunction, sir. The main transmitter coil seems to have overloaded and backfed into a dump capacitor, damaging several nearby circuits. The compensator computer rebuilt the pathway, but the bypass was close enough to one of the static damping command lines for the resulting inductance search to trigger it. An interesting set of coincidences, Thrawn said, his glowing eyes still on Kabarak. A natural malfunction, do you think? Or an artificial one? The my truck stirred, as if about to say something. Thrawn looked at her, and she subsided. Impossible to say, sir, the text said, choosing his words carefully. Obviously, he hadn't missed the fact that this was skating him close to the edge of insult in the middle of the group of Naguri. Might decide to take offense at it. Someone who knew what he was doing could probably have pulled it off. I have to say, though, sir, that compensator computers in general have a pretty low reputation among mechanics. They're okay on the really serious stuff that can get unskilled pilots into big trouble, but on non-critical reroutes like this, they've always had a tendency to follow up something else along the way. Thank you. If Thrawn was annoyed that he hadn't caught Kabarak red-handed in a lie, it didn't show in his face. Your team will take the ship back to Nystel for repairs. Yes, sir. The tech saluted and left. Thrawn looked back to Kabarak. With your team destroyed, you will of course have to be reassigned. He said. When your ship has been repaired, you will fly it to the Varar base in Glyth Sector and report there for duty. Yes, my lord, Kabrak said. Thrawn stood up. You have much to be proud of here, he said, inclining his head slightly to the Mitrock. Your family service to the Clan Kimbar and to the Empire will be long remembered by all of Onagar. As will your leadership and protection of the Naguri people, the Mitrock responded. Flanked by Rock and Urkum, Thrawn stepped down from the chair and headed back toward the double doors. Talion took up the rear, and a minute later they were once again out in the chilly night air. The shuttle was standing ready, and without further comment on ritual, Thrawn led the way inside. As they lifted, Talion caught just a glimpse out the viewport of the Nagori filing out of the Duca to watch their departing leaders. Well, that was pleasant, he muttered under his breath. Thrawn looked at him. A waste of time, you think, Captain? He asked mildly. Pelion glanced toward Urkum, seated farther toward the front of the shuttle. The Dynast didn't seem to be listening to them, but it would still probably still pay to be tactful. Diplomatically, sir, I'm sure it was worthwhile to demonstrate that you care about all of Onager, including the outer villages. He told Thrawn. Given that the commander ship really had malfunctioned, I don't think anything else was gained. Thrawn turned to stare out the side viewport. I'm not so sure of that, Captain. He said. There's something not quite right back there. Rook. What's your reading of our young commando, Kabarak? He was unsettled. The bodyguard told him quietly. That much I saw in his hands and his face. Urkum swiveled around in his chair. It is a naturally unsettling experience to face the lord of the Nogiri. He said. Particularly when one's hands are wet with failure. Ruck countered. Urkum half rose from his seat, and for a pair of heartbeats the air between the two Nogiri was thick with tension. Pelion felt himself pressing back into seat cushions, the long and bloody history of Naguri clan rivalry flooding fresh into his consciousness. This mission has generated several failures, Thrawn said calmly to the taut silence. In that, the clan Kimba hardly stands alone. Slowly, Urkum resumed his seat. Kabarak is still young, he said. He is indeed, Thrawn agreed. One reason, I presume, why he's such a bad liar. Rook, perhaps the dynast Urkim would enjoy the view from the forward section, 
Please escort him there. Yes, my lord. Ruck stood up. Dinah Starking? He said, gesturing toward the forward blast door. For a moment, the other Nagori didn't move. Then, with obvious reluctance, he stood up. My lord. He said stiffly and headed down the aisle. Thrawn waited until the door had closed on both the aliens before turning back to Pelion. Kagarak is hiding something, Captain. He said, a cold fire in his eyes. I'm certain of it. Yes, sir. Pelion said, wondering how the Grand Admiral had come to that conclusion. Certainly the routine sensor scan they just run hadn't picked up anything. Shall I order sensor focus on the village? That's not what I meant. Thrawn shook his head. He wouldn't have brought anything incriminating back to Onaker with him. You can't hide anything for long in one of these close-knit villages. No, it's something he's not telling us about that missing month. The one where he claims he was off meditating by himself. We might be able to learn something from his ship. Pelion suggested. Agreed. Thrawn nodded. Have a scanning crew go over it before the tanks get to work. Every cubic millimeter of it, interior and exterior both, and have surveillance put someone on Kavarak. Ah, yes, sir. Pelion said. One of our people, or another Nogiri. Thrawn cocked an eyebrow at him. The ridiculously obvious, or the heavily political, in other words. He asked dryly. Yes, you're right, of course. Let's try a third option. Does the Chimera carry any espionage droids? I don't believe so, sir. Pelion said, punching up the question on the shuttle's computer link. No. We have some Arachid Viper probe droids, but nothing of the more compact espionage class. Then we'll have to improvise. Thrawn said. Have Engineering put a Viper motivator into a decon droid and rig it with full-range optical and auditory sensors and a recorder. We'll have it put in with a group working out of Kabarak's village. Yes, sir. Pelion said, keying in the order. Do you want a transmitter installed, too? Thrawn shook his head. No, a recorder should be sufficient. The antenna would be difficult to conceal from view. The last thing we want is for some curious Nogiri to see it and wonder why this one was different. Pelion nodded his understanding, especially since that might lead the aliens to start pulling decon droids apart for a look inside. Yes, sir. I'll have the order placed right away. Thrawn's glowing eyes shifted to look out the viewport. There's no particular rush here, he said thoughtfully. Not now. This is the calm before the storm, Captain. And until the storm is ready to unleash, we might as well spend our time and energy making sure our illustrious Jedi Master will be willing to assist us when we want him. Which means bringing Leo Gana Solo to him. Exactly. Thrawn looked at the forward blast door. And if my presence is what the Nogiri need to inspire them, then my presence is what they'll have. For how long? Pelion asked. Thrawn smiled tightly. For as long as it takes. Chapter 11 Han? Lando's voice came from the cabin intercom beside the bunk. Wake up. Yeah, I'm awake. Han grunted, swiping at his eyes with one hand and swiveling the repeater displays toward him with the other. If there was one thing his years on the wrong side of the law had hammered into him, it was the knack of going from deep sleep to full alertness in a space between heartbeats. What's up? We're here. Lando announced. Whoever here is. I'll be right up. They were inside of their target planet by the time he dressed and made his way to the Lady Lux cockpit. Where's Arena's? He asked, peering out at the mottled blue-green crescent shape they were rapidly approaching. It looked pretty much like any of a thousand other planets he'd seen. She's gone back to the aft control station. Lando told him. I got the impression she wanted to be able to send down some recognition codes without us looking over her shoulder. Any idea where we are? Not really. Lando said. Transit time was 47 hours, but that doesn't tell us a whole lot. Han nodded, searching his memory. A dreadnought can pull what? About point four? About that. Lando agreed. When it's really in a hurry, anyway. Means we aren't any more than 150 light years from New Cove, then. I'd guess we're closer than that myself. Lando said. It wouldn't make much sense to use New Cove as a contact point if they were that far away. 
Unless New Cove was Bralia's idea and not theirs. Tom pointed out. Possible. Lando said. I still think we're closer than 150 light years, though. They could have taken their time getting here just to mislead us. Han looked up at the dreadnought that had been hauling them through hyperspace for the past two days. Or to have time to organize a reception committee. There's that. Lando nodded. I don't know if I mentioned it, but after they apologized for getting the magnetic coupling off center over our hatch, I went back and took a look. You didn't mention it, but I did the same thing. Han said sorrowly. Looked kind of deliberate, didn't it? That's what I thought, too. Lando said. Like, maybe they wanted an excuse to keep us cooped up down here and not wandering around their ship. Could be lots of good and innocent reasons for that. Han reminded him. And lots of not-so-innocent ones. Lando countered. You sure you don't have any idea who this commander of theirs might be? Not even a guess. Probably be finding out real soon, though. The comm crackled on. Lady Luck, this is Senna, a familiar voice said. We've arrived. Yes, we noticed. Lando told her. I expect you'll want us to follow you down. Right, she said. The Peregrine will drop the magnetic coupling whenever you're ready to fly. Han stared at the speaker, barely hearing Lando's response. A ship called the Peregrine? You still with me? Han focused on Lando, noticing with mild surprise that the other's conversation with Senna had ended. Yeah. He said. Sure. It's just that name, Peregrine, rang an old bell. You've heard of it? Not the ship, no. Han shook his head. The Peregrine was an old Corellian scare legend they used to tell when I was a kid. He was some old ghostly guy who'd been cursed to wander around the world forever and never find his home again. It used to make me feel real creepy. From above came a clang, and with the jolt they were free from the dreadnought. Lando eased them away from the huge warship, looking up as it passed by overhead. Well, try to remember it was just a legend. He reminded Han. Han looked at the dreadnought. Sure. He said a little too quickly. I know that. They followed Senna's freighter down and were soon skimming over what appeared to be a large, grassy plain dotted with patches of stubbly, coniferous trees. A wall of craggy cliffs loomed directly ahead, an ideal spot, Han's old smuggler instincts told him, to hide a spaceship's support and servicing base. A few minutes later, his hunch was borne out as, sweeping over a low ridge, they came to the encampment. An encampment that was far too large to be merely a servicing base. Rows upon rows of camouflage structures filled the plain just beneath the cliffs. Everything from small living quarters to large admin and supply sheds to still larger maintenance and tool buildings, up to a huge camo roof to refurbishing hangar. The perimeter was dotted with squat, turret-topped cylinders of Golan Arms anti-infantry batteries and a few of the longer Spezok anti-vehicle weapons, along with some KAAC Freerunner assault vehicles parked in defensive posture. Lando whistled softly under his breath. Would you look at that, he said. What is this, someone's private army? Looks that way, Han agreed, feeling the skin on the back of his neck starting to crawl. He'd run into private armies before, and they'd never been anything but trouble. I think I'm starting not to like this, Lando decided, easing the Lady Luck gingerly over the outer sentry line. Ahead, Senna's freighter was approaching a landing pad barely visible against the rest of the ground. You sure you want to go through with this? What, with three dreadnoughts standing on our heads out there? Han snorted. I don't think we've got a whole lot of choice. Not in this crate, anyway. Probably right. Lando conceded, apparently too preoccupied to notice the insult to his ship. So what do we do? Senna's freighter had dropped its landing skids and was settling onto the pad. I guess we go down and behave like invited guests, Han said. Lando nodded at Han's blaster. You don't think they'll object to their invited guests coming in armed? Let them object first, Han said grimly. Then we'll discuss it. Lando put the Lady Luck down beside the freighter, and together he and Han made their way to the aft hatchway. Irina, as her transmission shorts finished, was waiting there for them, her own blaster strapped prominently to her hip. A transport skiff was parked outside, and as the three of them headed down the ramp, Senna and a handful of her entourage came around the Lady Luck's bow. Most of the others were dressed in a casual tan uniform of an unfamiliar but vaguely Corellian cut. Senna, by contrast, was still in the nondescript civilian garb she'd been wearing on New Cove. Welcome to our base of operations, Senna said, waving her hand to encompass the encampment around them. If you'll come with us, the commander is waiting to meet you. Busy looking place you've got here, Han commented as they all boarded the skiff. You're getting ready to start a war or something? We're not in the business of starting wars, Senna said coolly. Ah. Han nodded, looking around as the driver swung the skiff around and headed off through the camp. There was something about the layout that seemed vaguely familiar. Lando got it first. You know, this place looks a lot like one of the old Alliance bases we used to work out of, he commented to Senna. 
Only built on the surface instead of dug in underground. It does look that way, doesn't it? Senna agreed, her voice not giving anything away. You've had dealings with the Alliance, then? Lando probed gently. Senna didn't answer. Lando looked at Han, eyebrows raised. Han shrugged slightly in return. Whatever was going on here, it was clear that the hired hands weren't in the habit of talking about it. The skiff came to a halt beside an administration building, indistinguishable from the others nearby except for the two uniformed guards flanking the doorway. They saluted as Senna approached, one of them reaching over to pull the door open. The commander asked to see you for a moment alone, Captain Solo, Senna said, stopping by the open door. We'll wait out here with General Calrissian. Right, Han said. Taking a deep breath, he stepped inside. From its outside appearance, he expected it to be a standard administrative center, with an outer reception area and a honeycomb of comfy executive office stacked behind it. To his mild surprise, he found himself instead in a fully equipped war room. Lining the walls were common tracking consoles, including at least one crystal graph tra- graph field trap receptor, and what looked like a range and control for a KDY V-150 planet defender ion cannon like the one the Alliance had had to abandon on Hoth. In the center of the room, a large hollow display showed a sector's worth of stars, with a hundred multicolored markers and vector lines scattered among the glittering white dots. And sitting beside the hollow was a man. His face was distorted somewhat by the strangely colored lights playing on it from the display. And it was, at any rate, a face Han had never seen except in pictures. But even so, recognition came with the sudden jolt of an overhead thunderclap. Senator Bowibus. He breathed. Welcome to Peregrine's Nest, Captain Solo. The other said gravely, coming away from the hollow toward him. I'm flattered you still remember me. It'd be hard for any Corellian to forget you, sir. Han said, his numbed brain noting vaguely in passing that there are very few people in the galaxy who rated an automatic sir from him. But you... We're dead? Bell Ilba suggested, a half-smile creasing his lined face. Well, yes. Han floundered. I mean, everyone thought you died on Anchoron. In a very real sense, I did. The other said quietly, the smile fading from his face. Closer now, Han was struck with just how lined with age and stress the senator's face was. The Emperor wasn't quite able to kill me at Anchoron, but he might just as well have done so. He took everything I had except my life. My family, my profession, even all future contacts with mainstream Corellian society. He forced me outside the law I'd worked so hard to create and maintain. The smile returned, like a hint of sunshine around the edge of a dark cloud. Forced me to become a rebel. I imagine you understand the feeling. Pretty well, yeah. Han said, grinning lopsidedly in return. He read in school about the legendary presence of the equally legendary Senator Garm Bell Iblis. Now he was getting to see that charm up close. It made him feel like a school kid again. I still can't believe this. I wish we'd known sooner. We could really have used this army of yours during the war. For just a second, a shadow seemed to cross Bell Iblis's face. We probably couldn't have done much to help, he said. It's taken us a good deal of time to build up to what you see here. His smile returned. But there will be time to talk about that later. Right now, I see you standing there trying to figure out exactly when it was we met. Actually, Han had forgotten about Senna's references to a previous meeting. Tell you the truth, I haven't got a clue. He confessed. Unless it was after Anchoron and you were in disguise or something. Bill Iblis shook his head. No disguise. But it wasn't something I'd really expect you to remember. I'll give you a hint. You were all of eleven at the time. Han blinked. Eleven? He echoed. You mean in school? Correct. Bell Iblis nodded. Literally correct, in fact. He was at a convocation at your school, where you were being forced to listen to a group of us old fossils talk about politics. Han felt his face warming. The specific memory was still a blank, but that was how he'd felt about politicians at the time of his life. But though come to think of it, the opinion hadn't changed all that much over the years. I'm sorry, but I still don't remember. As I said, I didn't expect you to. The Iblis explained. I, on the other hand, remember the incident quite well. During the question period after the talk, you asked two irreverently phrased yet highly pointed questions. The first regarding the ethics of the anti-alien bias starting to creep into the legal structure of the Republic. The second about some very specific instances of corruption involving my colleagues in the Senate. It was starting to come back, at least in a vague sort of way. Yeah, I remember now. Han said slowly. I think one of my friends dared me to throw those questions at you. He probably figured I'd get in trouble for not being polite. I was in trouble enough that it didn't bother me. Setting your life pattern early, were you? Bell Ilbis suggested dryly. 
At any rate, they weren't the sort of questions I would have expected from an 11-year-old, and they intrigued me enough to ask about you. I've been keeping a somewhat loose eye on you ever since. Hunt grimaced. You probably weren't very impressed by what you saw. There were times... Del Iblis explained. I'll admit to having been extremely disappointed when you were dismissed from the Imperial Academy. You'd shown considerable promise there, and I felt at the time that a strongly loyal officer corps was one of the few defenses the Republic still had left against the collapse toward Empire. He shrugged. Under the circumstances, it's just as well that you got out when you did. With your obvious disdain for authority, you'd have been quietly eliminated in the Emperor's purge of those officers he hadn't been able to seduce to his side. And then things would have gone quite differently, wouldn't they? Maybe a little. Hunt conceded modestly. He glanced around the war room. So how long have you been here at? You call it Peregrine's Nest? Oh, we never stay anywhere for very long. Bel Iblis explained, clapping a hand on Han's shoulder and gently but firmly turning him toward the door. Sit still too long and the Imperials will eventually find you. But we can talk business later. Right now your friend outside is probably getting nervous. Come introduce me to him. Lando was indeed looking a little tense as Han and Bel Iblis stepped out into the sunlight again. It's all right. Han assured him. We're with friends. Senator, this is Lando Carrizian, one-time general of the Rebel Alliance. Lando, Senator Garm Belliblis. He hadn't expected Lando to recognize the name of a long-past Corellian politician. He was right. Senator Belliblis? Lando nodded, his voice neutral. Honored to meet you, General Carrizian. Belliblis said. I've heard a great deal about you. Lando glanced at Han. Just Carrizian, he said. The general is more a cursy title now. Then we're even. Bel Iblis smiled. I'm not a senator anymore, either. He waved a hand at Senna. You've met my chief advisor and unofficial ambassador at large, Senna Lurk Void Medanil. And? He paused, looking around. I understood Irenus was with you. She was needed back at the ship, sir, Senna told him. Our other guests required some soothing. Yes, Council Aid Brelia. Bel Iblis said, glancing in the direction of the landing pad. This could prove somewhat awkward. Yes, sir, Senna said. Perhaps I shouldn't have brought him here, but at the time I didn't see any other reasonable course of action. Oh, I agree. Bell Ibbis assured her. Leaving him in the middle of an Imperial raid would have been more than simply awkward. Han felt a slight chill run through him. In the flush of excitement over meeting Bell Ibbis, he'd completely forgotten what had taken him to Nukov in the first place. You seem to be on good terms with Bralia, Senator. He said carefully. Bell Ibbis eyed him. And you'd like to know just what those good terms entail? Han steeled himself. As a matter of fact, sir, yes, I would. The other smiled slightly. You still have that underlying refusal to flinch before authority, don't you? Good. Come on over to the headquarters lounge, and I'll tell you anything you want to know. His smile hardened just a little. And after that, I'll have some questions to ask you as well. The door slid open and Pelion stepped into the dark and antechamber of Thrawn's private command room. Dark and apparently empty, but Pelion knew better than that. I have important information for the Grand Admiral, he said loudly. I don't have time for these little games of yours. They are not games. Ruck's gravely voice mewed right in Pelion's ear, making him jump despite his best efforts not to. Stalking skills must be practiced or lost. Practice on someone else, Pelion growled. I have work to do. He stepped forward to the inner door, silently cursing Ruck and the whole Maguri race. Useful tools of the Empire they might well be, but he'd dealt with this kind of close-knit clan structure before, and he'd never found such primitives to be anything but trouble in the long run. The door to the command room slid open, revealing a darkness that only by softly glowing candles. Pelion stepped abruptly, his mind flashing back to that eerie crypt on Wayland, where a thousand candles marked the graves of off-rollers who had come there over the past few years, only to be slaughtered by Joros Sebeoth. For Thondrev turned his command room into a duplicate of that. No, I haven't come under the influence of our unstable Jedi Master. Thrawn's voice came dryly across the room. Over the candles, Pelion could just see the Grand Admiral's glowing red eyes. Look closer. Pelion did as instructed, to discover that the candles were in fact holographic images of exquisitely delicate lighted sculptures. Beautiful, aren't they? Thrawn said, his voice meditative. 
their Corellian flame miniatures, one of that very short list of art forms, which others have tried to copy, but never truly been able to duplicate. Nothing more than shaped transoptical fibers, pseudoluminescent plant material, and a pair of ghoulish light sources, really. And yet, somehow, there's something about them that's never been captured by anyone else. The holographic flames faded away, and in the center of the room, a frozen image of three dreadnought cruisers appeared. This was taken by the Relentless two days ago off the planet Nukov, Captain. Dron continued in the same thoughtful tone. Watch closely. He started the recording, telling him watch and sounds as the dreadnoughts, in triangular formation, opened fire with ion cannons toward the camera's point of view. Almost hidden in the fury of the assault, a freighter in what looked like a small pleasure yacht could be seen skittering to safety down the middle of the formation. Still firing, the dreadnoughts began drawing back, and a minute later the whole group had jumped to light speed. The hollow faded away, and the room lights came up to a gentle glow. Comments? Strahd invited. Looks like our old friends are back, Talion said. They seem to have recovered from that scare we gave them at Lenori. A nuisance, especially right now. Unfortunately, indications are that they're about to become more than just a nuisance, Ron told him. One of the two ships they were rescuing was identified by the Relentless as the Lady Luck, with Han Solo and Lando Calrissian aboard. Pellion frowned. Solo and Calrissian? But... He broke off sharply. But they were supposed to go to the Palani system. Thrawn finished for him. Yes, an error on my part. Obviously, something more important came up than their concerns for Akbar's reputation. Talia looked back at where the hollow had been. Such as adding new strength to the rebellion military. I don't believe they've merged quite yet. Thrawn said, his forehead furrowed with thought. Nor do I believe such an alliance is inevitable. That was a Corellian leading that task force, Captain. I'm sure of that now. And there are only a few possibilities as to just who that Corellian might be. A stray memory clicked. Solo is Corellian, isn't he? Yes. Don confirmed. One reason I think they're still in the negotiation stage. If they're leaders, who I suspect, he might well prefer sounding out a fellow Corellian before making any commitment to the Rebellion's leaders. To Thrawn's left, the comp pinged. Admiral Thrawn, we have the contact you requested with the Relentless. Thank you, Thrawn said, tapping a switch. In front of the double circle of repeater displays, a three-quarter-sized hologram of an elderly Imperial officer appeared, standing next to be what appeared to be a detention block control board. Grand Admiral, the image said, nodding gravely. Good day, Captain Dorsha. Thrawn nodded back. You have the prisoner I asked for. Right here, sir, Dorsha said. He glanced off to the side and gestured, and from off-camera a rather bulky human appeared, his hands shackled in front of him, his expression studiously neutral behind his neatly trimmed beard. His name's Niles Ferrier, Dorja said. We picked him and his crew up during the raid on Nukov, the raid from which Skywalker, Solo, and Calrissian escaped, Thrawn said. Dorja winced. Yes, sir. Thrawn shifted his attention to the Ferrier. Captain Ferrier, he nodded, our records indicate that you specialize in spaceship theft, yet you were picked up on Nukov with a cargo of biomolecules aboard your ship. Would you care to explain? Ferrier shrugged fractionally. Palming ships isn't something you can do every day, he said. It takes opportunities and planning. Taking the occasional shipping job helps make ends meet. You're aware, of course, that the biomolecules were undeclared. Yes, Captain Dorch had told me that. Ferrier said with just the right mixture of astonishment and indignation. Believe me, if I'd known I was being made a party to such cheating against the Empire, I presume you're also aware... Thrawn cut him off. ...that for such actions I can not only confiscate your cargo, but also your ship. Ferrier was aware of that, all right. Pellin could see it in the pinched look around his eyes. I've been helpful to the Empire in the past, Admiral, he said evenly. 
I've smuggled in loads of contraband from the New Republic, and only recently delivered three CNR patrol ships to your people. And were paid outrageous sums of money in all cases. Thrawn reminded him. If you're trying to suggest we owe you for past kindnesses, don't bother. However, there may be a way for you to pay back this new debt. Did you happen to notice the ships attacking the Relentless as you were trying to sneak away from the planets? Of course I did! Ferrier said, a touch of wounded professional pride creeping into his voice. They were Rendilly Star Drive dreadnoughts, old ones by the look of them, but spry enough. Probably undergone a lot of refitting. They have indeed. Thrawn smiled slightly. I want them. It took Ferrier a handful of seconds for the offhand-sounding comment to register. When it did, his mouth dropped open. You mean... me? Do you have a problem with that? Thrawn asked coldly. Uh... Ferrier swallowed. Admiral, with all due respect, you have three standard months to get me either those ships or else their precise location. Thrawn cut him off. Captain Dorja. Dorja stepped forward again. Sir, you will release Captain Ferrier and his crew and supply them with an unmarked intelligence freighter to use. Their own ship will remain on board the Relentless until they've completed their mission. Understood. Dorja nodded. Thrawn cocked an eyebrow. One other thing, Captain Ferrier. On the off chance that you might feel yourself tempted to abandon the assignment and make a run for it, the freighter you'll be given will be equipped with an impressive and totally unbreakable doomsday mechanism with exactly three standard months set on its clock. I trust you understand. Above his beard, Ferrier's face had gone rather sickly white. Yes. He managed. Good. Thrawn shifted his attention back to Dorja. I leave the details in your hands, Captain. Keep me informed of developments. He tapped a switch and the hologram faded away. As I said, Captain. Thrawn said, turning to Pelion. I don't think an alliance with the Rebellion is necessarily inevitable. Etheria can pull it off. Pelion said doubtfully. He has a reasonable chance. Thrawn assured him. After all, we have a general idea ourselves of where they might be hidden. We just don't have the time and manpower at the moment to properly root them out. Even if we did, a large-scale attack would probably end up destroying the Dreadnoughts, and I'd rather capture them intact. Yes, sir. Pelion said grimly. The word capture had reminded him of why he'd come here in the first place. Admiral, the report on Kabarak's ship has come in from the scanning team. He held the data card over the double display circle. For a moment, Thrawn's glowing red eyes burned into Pelion's face, as if trying to read the reason for his subordinate's obvious tension. Then, wordlessly, he took the data card from the captain's hand and slid it into his reader. Pelion waited, tight-lipped, as the Grand Admiral skimmed the report. Thrawn reached the end and leaned back in his seat, his face unreadable. Wookie hairs, he said. Yes, sir. Pelia nodded. All over the ship. Thrawn was silent, another few heartbeats. Your interpretation? Pelia embraced himself. I can only see one, sir. Cabrock didn't escape from the Wookiees on Kashyyyk at all. They caught him, and then let him go. After a month of imprisonment. Thrawn looked up at Pelia. And interrogation. Almost certainly. Pelion agreed. The question is, what did he tell them? There's one way to find out. Thrawn tapped on the comm. Hangar Bay, this is the Grand Admiral. Prepare my shuttle. I'm going to the surface. I want a troop shuttle and double squad of stormtroopers ready to accompany me, plus two flights of scimitar assault bombers to provide air cover. He got an acknowledgement and keyed off. It may be, Captain, that the Nogiri have forgotten where their loyalties lie, he told Pelion, standing up and stepping out around the displays. I think it's time they were reminded that the Empire commands here. You'll return to the breach and prepare a suitable demonstration. Yes, sir. Pelion hesitated. Do you want merely a reminder, not actual destruction? Thrawn's eyes blazed. 
For the moment, yes. He said his voice, I see. Let them all pray that I don't change my mind. Chapter 12. It was a smell Leia noticed first as she drifted slowly awake. A smoky smell, reminiscent of the wood fires of the Ewoks of Endor, but with the tangy sharpness all its own. A warm, homey sort of aroma, reminding her of the camp out she had as a child on Alderaan. And then she woke up enough to remember where she was. Full consciousness flooded in, and she snapped open her eyes. To find herself lying on a rough pallet in a corner of the Nagori communal bakehouse, exactly where she'd been when she'd fallen asleep the night before. She sat up, feeling relieved and a little ashamed. What with that unexpected visit last night by the Grand Admiral, she realized she'd half expected to wake up in a Star Destroyer detention cell. Clearly she underestimated the Nagori's ability to stick by their promises. Her stomach growled, reminding her that it had been a long time since she'd eaten. A little lower down, one of the twins kicked a reminder of his own. Okay, she soothed. I get the hint. Breakfast time. She tore the top off a ration bar from one of her cases and took a bite, looking around the bakehouse as she chewed. Against the wall by the door, the double pallet had been laid out for Chewbacca to sleep on was empty. For a moment, the fear of betrayal again whispered to her, but a little concentration through the forest sound sent concerns. Chewbacca was somewhere nearby, with a sense that gave no indication of danger. Relax, she ordered herself sternly, pulling a fresh jumpsuit out of her case and starting to get dressed. Whatever these Noguri were, it was clear they weren't savages. They were honorable people, in their own way, and they wouldn't turn over to the Empire. At least not until they heard her out. She downed the last bite of ration bar and finished dressing, making sure as always that her belt didn't hang too heavily across her increasingly swollen belly. Retrieving her lightsaber from its hiding place under the edge of the pallet, she fashioned it prominently to her side. Cabrak, she remembered, had seemed to find reassurance of her identity in the presence of the Jedi weapon. Hopefully the rest of the group would also respond that way. Stepping to the bakehouse door, she ran through her Jedi calming exercises and went outside. Three small Nagori children were playing with an inflatable ball in the grassy area outside the door, their grayish-white skin glistening with perspiration in the bright morning sunlight. A sunlight that wasn't going to last, Leia saw. A uniform layer of dark clouds ascending all the way to the west was even now creeping its way east toward the rising sun. All for the best. A thick layer of clouds would block any direct telescopic observations a star destroyed up there might make of the village, as well as diffuse the non negating threat signatures she and Chewbacca were giving off. She looked back down to find the three children had halted in their game, and formed a straight line in front of her. Hello, she said, trying to smile on them. The child in the middle stepped forward and dropped to his knees in an awkward but passable imitation of his elder's gesture of respect. Malarush, he mewed. Miss Kaha, is Kark, Miss Sok, Mirska. I see, Leia said, wishing fervently that she had Dripio with her. She was just wondering if he should risk calling him on the comlinks when the child spoke again. I greet you, Mahrush, he said, the basic coming out mangled but understandable. The matrach waits for you, Din Daduka. Thank you, Leia nodded gravely to him. Door wardens last night, official greeters this morning. The Nagori children seem to be introduced early into the rituals and responsibilities of their culture. Please escort me to her. The child made the respect gesture again and got back to his feet, heading off toward the large circular structure that Kabarak had landed next to the night before. Leia followed, the other two children taking up positions to either side of her. She found herself throwing short glances at them as they walked, wondering at the light color of their skin. Kabarak's skin was a steel gray. The matrix had been much darker. Did the Nagori consist of several distinct racial types? Or was the darkening a natural part of their aging process? She made a mental note to ask Kabarak about it when she had the chance. The Duca, seen down in full daylight, was far more elaborate than she'd realized. The pillars spaced every few meters around the wall seemed to be composed of whole sections of tree trunk, stripped of bark and smoothed to a black marble finish. The shimmery wood that made up the rest of the walls was covered in perhaps half its height with intricate carvings. As she got closer, she could see that the reinforced metal band that encircled the building, just beneath the eaves, was also decorated leafily, the Nagori believing combining function and art. The whole structure was perhaps twenty meters across and four meters high. With another three or four meters for the conical roof, and she found herself wondering how many more pillars they'd had to put inside to support the thing. Tall double doors had been built into the wall between two of the pillars, flanked at the moment by two straight-backed Nagori children. They pulled open the doors as Leia approached. Nodding her thanks, she stepped inside. The interior of the Duca was no less impressive than its exterior. It was a single open room, with a throne-like chair two-thirds of the way to the back, a small booth with an angled roof and a dark meshed window built against the wall between two of the pillars to the right and a wall chart of some sort directly across from it on the left. There were no internal support pillars. Instead, a series of heavy chains had been strung from the top of each of the wall pillars to the edge of a large conclave dish hanging over the center of the room. 
From inside the dish, just inside this rim lay, decided, hidden lights played upward against the ceiling, providing a softly diffused illumination. A few meters in front of the chart, a group of perhaps twenty small children were sitting in a semicircle around 3PO, who was holding forth in a language with what was obviously some kind of story, complete with occasional sound effects. It brought to mind the condensed version of their struggle against the Empire that he'd given the Ewoks, and Leia hoped the droid would remember not to vilify Darth Vader here. Presumably he would. She drummed a point into him often enough during the voyage. A small movement off to the left caught her eye. Chewbacca and Kabarak were sitting facing each other on the other side of the door, engaged in some kind of quiet activity that seemed to involve hands and wrists. The Wookiee had paused and was looking questioningly in her direction. Leia nodded her assurance that she was all right, trying to read from his senses just what he and Kabarak were doing. At least it didn't seem to involve ripping the Naguri's arms out of their sockets. That was something, anyway. Lady Vader, a gravelly Naguri voice said. Leia turned back to see the Matriarch walking up to her. I greet you. You slept well. Quite well, Leia told her. Your hospitality has been most honorable. She looked over at 3PO, wondering if she should call him back to his duties as translator. The Mytrak misunderstood. It is the history time for the children, she said. Your machine graciously volunteered to tell him the last story of our lord, Darth Vader. Vader's final self-sacrificial defiance against the Emperor, with Luke's life hanging in the balance. Yes, Leia murmured. It took until the end. He was finally able to rid himself of the Emperor's web of deception. For a moment, the Mytrak was silent. Then she stirred. Walk with me, Lady Vader. She turned and began walking along the wall. Leia joined her, noticing the first time that the Dukas in the walls were decorated with carvings, too. The historical record of their family. My third son has gained a new respect for your Wookiee, she said, gesturing toward Chewbacca and Kabarak. Our lord, the Grand Admiral, came last eve, seeking proof that my third son had deceived him about this flying craft being broken. Because of your Wookiee, he found no such proof. Leia nodded. Yes, Chewie told me last night about mimicking the ship. I don't have his knowledge of spaceship mechanics, but I know it can't be easy to fake a pair of link malfunctions the way he did. It's fortunate for all of us he had the foresight and skill to do so. The Wookiee is not of your family or clan, the Matrax said. Yet you trust him, as if he were a friend. Leia took a deep breath. I never knew my true father, the Lord Vader, as I was growing up. I was instead taken to Alderaan and raised by the Viceroy as if I was his own child. On Alderaan, as it seems to be the case here, family relationships are the basis of our culture and society. I grew up memorizing lists of aunts and uncles and cousins, learning how to place them in order of closest to my adoptive line. She gestured to Chewbacca. Chewie was once merely a good friend. Now he's part of my family, as much a part as my husband and brother are. They were perhaps a quarter of the way around the Duca before the Matrax spoke again. Why have you come here? Kabrak told me his people needed help, Leia said simply. I thought there might be something I could do. Some will say you have come to sow discord among us. You said that yourself last night, Leia reminded her. I can only give you my word that discord is not my intention. The Matriarch made a long, hissing sound that ended with a sharp double-click of needle teeth. The goal and the end are not always the same, Lady Vader. Now we serve one over clan only. You would require service to another. This is the seed of discord and death. Leia pursed her lips. Does the service to the Empire satisfy you, then, she asked. Does it gain your people better life or higher honor? We serve the Empire as one clan, the Matriarch said. For you to demand our service would be to bring back the conflicts of old. They had reached the wall chart now, and she gestured a thin hand up toward it. Do you see our history, Lady Vader? Leia craned her neck to look. Neatly carved lines of alien script covered the bottom two-thirds of the wall, with each word connected to a dozen others in a bewildering crisscross of vertical, horizontal, and angled lines, each cut seemingly of a different width and depth. Then she got it. The chart was a genealogical tree either the entire clan Kimbar, or else just this particular family. I see it, she said. Then you see the terrible destruction of life created by the conflicts of old, the Matrix said. She gestured to three or four places in the chart, which were, to Leia, indistinguishable from the rest of the design. Reading the Goy genealogies was apparently an acquired skill. I do not wish to return to those days, the Matrix continued, not even for the daughter of the Lord Darth Vader. I understand, Leia said quietly, shivering as the ghost of Yavin, Hoth, and Dorne a hundred more rose up before her. 
I have seen more conflict and death in my lifetime than I ever thought possible. I have no wish to add to the list. Then you must leave, the Matrix said firmly. You must leave and not come back while the Empire lives. They began to walk again. Is there no alternative, Leia asked. What if I could persuade all of your people to leave their service to the Empire? There would be no conflict then among you. The Emperor aided us when no one else would, the Matrix reminded her. That was only because we didn't know about your need, Leia said, feeling the twinge of conscience at the half-truth. Yes, the Alliance had truly not known about the desperate situation here, and yes, my Mothma and the other leaders would certainly have wanted to help if they had, but whether they would have had the resources to actually do anything was another question entirely. We know now, and we offer you our help. Do you offer us aid for our own sakes? The Matrek asked pointedly. Or merely to wrest our service from the Empire to your Opa clan? We will not be fought over like a bone among hungry Stava. The Emperor used you, Leia said flatly, as the Grand Animal uses you now. Has the aid they'd given been worth the sons they'd taken from you and sent off to die? They had gone another twenty steps or so before the Matrek answered. Our sons have gone, she said softly, but with their service they have bought us life. You came in a flying craft, Lady Vader. You saw what was done to our land. Yes, Leia said with a shiver. I hadn't realized how widespread the destruction had been. Life on Onager has always been a struggle, the Matrix, the Matrix said. The land has required much labor to tame. You saw in the history the times when the struggle was lost. But after the battle in the sky, she shuddered, a peculiar kind of shaking that seemed to move from her hips upward to her shoulders. It was like a war between gods. We now know that it was only large flying craft high above the land. But then we knew nothing of such things. Their lightning flashed across the sky, through the night and into the next day, brightening the distant mountains with their fury. And yet there was no thunder, as if, as if those same gods were too angry even to shout at each other as they fought. I remember being more frightened of the silence than of any other part of it. Only once was there a distant crash like thunder. It was much later before we learned that one of our higher mountains had lost its uppermost peak. Then the lightning stopped, and we dared to hope that the gods had taken their war away from us. Until the ground shake came. She paused, another shudder running through her. The lightning had been the anger of the gods. The ground shake was their war hammer. Whole cities vanished as the ground opened up beneath them. Fire mountains that had been long quiet sent out flame and smoke that darkened the sky over all the land. Forests and fields burned, as did cities and villages that survived the ground shake itself. From those who had died came sickness, and still more died after them. It was as if the fury of the sky gods had come among the gods of the land, and they too were fighting among themselves. And then, when they finally dared to hope it was over, the strange smelling rain began to fall. Leia nodded, the whole sequence of events painfully clear. One of the warring ships had crashed, setting off massive earthquakes and releasing toxic chemicals which had been carried by wind and rain to every part of the planet. There were any number of such chemicals in use aboard a modern warship, but it was only the older ships that carried anything as virulent as this chemical must have been. Older ships, which had been virtually all the Rebel Alliance had to fight with in the beginning. A fresh surge of guilt swissed like a blade in her stomach. We did this, she thought miserably. Our ship. Our fault. Was it the rain that killed the plants? The Empire's people had a main floor was in the rain, the Matrix said. I do not know what it was. They came straight after the disaster, then. The Lord Vader and the others. Yes. The Matrix waved her hands to encompass the area around them. We had gathered together here all who were left alive and could make the journey. This place had always been a truce ground between clans. We had come here to try to find a way for survival. It was here that the Lord Vader found us. They walked in silence for another minute. Some believe, then, that he was a god, the Matrix said. All feared, all feared him and his mighty silver flying craft that had brought him and his attendants from the sky. But even amid the fear, there was anger at what the gods had done to us, and nearly two tens of warriors chose to attack. And were duly slaughtered, Leia said grimly. The thought of effectively unarmed primitives taking on imperial troops made her wince. They were not slaughtered, the Matrix retorted, and there was no mistaking the pride in her voice. Only three of the two tens died in the battle. In turn, they killed many of the Lord Vader's attendants, despite their lightning weapons and rock garments. 
It was only when the Lord Vader himself intervened that the warriors were defeated. But instead of destroying us, as some of the attendants counseled, he instead offered us peace, peace, and the blessing and aid of the Emperor. Leia nodded, one more piece of the puzzle falling into place. She had wondered why the Emperor would have bothered with what to him would have been nothing more than a tiny group of primitive non-humans. But primitive non-humans with that kind of natural fighting skill were something else entirely. What sort of aid did he bring? All that we needed, the Matrix said. Food and medicine and tools came at once. They too, when a strange rain began to kill our crops, he sent metal droids to begin cleaning the poison from our land. Leia winced, freshly aware of the twins' vulnerability, for the analysis kit had found no trace of anything toxic in the air as they approached the village, and Chewbacca and Kabarak had done similar tests in the soil. Whatever it was that had been in the rain, the decon droids had done a good job getting rid of it. And still nothing will grow outside the clean land? Only the calm grass, the matrix said. It is a poor plant, of no use as food, but it alone can grow now, and even it no longer smells as it once did, which explained the uniform brown color that she and Chewbacca had seen from space. Somehow that particular plant had adapted to the toxic soil. Did any of the animals survive, she asked? Some did. Those who could eat the calm grass, and those which in turn ate them. But they are few. The matriarch looked at her head, as if looking in her mind's eye toward the distant hills. This place was never rich with life, Lady Vader. Perhaps that was why the clans had chosen it as a truce ground. But even in so desolate a place, there were still animals and plants without count. They are gone now. She straightened up, busily putting the memory behind her. The Lord Vader helped us in other ways as well. He sent attendants to teach our sons and daughters the ways and customs of the Empire. He issued new orders to allow all clans to share the clean land, though for all clans to live beside one another this way had never happened since the beginning. She gestured around her, and he sent mighty flying craft into desolation to find and bring unto us our clan dukas. She turned her dark eyes to gaze at Leia. We have an honorable peace, Lady Vader. Whatever the cost, we pay it gladly. Across the room, the children had apparently finished their lesson and were getting to their feet. One of them spoke to 3PO, making a sort of truncated version of their face-down bow. George replied, then the whole group turned and headed for the door, where two adults awaited them. Break time, Play asked. The glad lessons are over for today, the matriarch said. The children must now begin their share of the work in the village. Later in the evening, they will have the lessons which will equip them to someday serve the Empire. Leia shook her head. It's not right, she told the matriarch, as the children filed out of the dukkah. No people should have to sell their children to return to life. The matriarch gave a long hiss. It is the debt we owe, she said. How else shall we pay it? Leia squeezed her thumb and forefinger together. How else, indeed? Clearly, the empire was quite happy with the bargain it had made, and having seen the Nagori commandos in action, she could well understand satisfaction. They wouldn't be interested in letting the Nagori buy out of their debt in any other way and if the Nagori themselves considered their service to be a debt of honor to their saviors. I don't know. She had to concede. A movement to the side had caught her attention. Kabarak, still sitting on the floor across the room, had fallen over onto his side, with Chewbacca's hand engulfing in his wrist. It looked like fighting, except that Chewbacca's sense didn't indicate anger. What are they doing over there? she asked. Your Wookiee has instructed my third son to instruct him in our fighting methods, the matriarch answered, pride again touching her voice. Wookiees have great strength, but no knowledge of the subtlety of combat. It was probably not an assessment the Wookiees themselves would have agreed with. But Leia had to admit that Chewbacca, at least, had always seemed to rely mainly on brute force and bowcast for accuracy. I'm surprised he was willing to have Kabarak teach him, she said. He's never really trusted him. Perhaps it is that same distrust that whets his interest, the Matrix said dryly. Leia had to smile. Perhaps. For a minute, they watched in silence as Kabarak showed Chewbacca two more wrist and arm locks. They seemed to be variants of the techniques Leia had learned in her youth in Alderaan, and she shivered once at the thought of those moves with Wookiee muscle behind them. You will understand the cycle of our life now, Lady Vader, the Matrix said quietly. You must realize that we still hang by spider silk. Even now, we do not have enough clean land to grow sufficient food. We must continue to buy from the Empire. Payment with for which requires that much more service from your sons, Leia nodded, grimacing. Permanent debt, the oldest form of covert slavery in the galaxy. It also encourages the sending away of our sons, the Matriarch added bitterly. Even if the Empire allowed it, 
we could not now bring all our sons home. We would not have food for them. Lay nodded again. It was as neat and tidy a box as she'd ever seen anyone trapped in. She should expect no lesser invader than the Emperor. They'll never be entirely out of their debt, she told the matron bluntly. You know that, don't you? As long as you're useful to them, the Great Admiral will make sure of that. Yes, the matron said softly. It has taken a long time, but now I believe that. If all Nogori believe so, changes could perhaps be made. But the rest of the Nogori still believe the Empire is their friend. Not all believe so, but enough. She stopped and gestured upward. Do you see the starlight, Lady Vader? Leia looked up at the conclave dish that hung four meters off the ground, at the intersection of the wall support chains. About a meter and a half across, it was composed of some kind of black wood or blackened metal, and perforated with hundreds of tiny pinholes. With the light from the inside room of the dish winking through like stars, the whole effect was remarkably like a stylized version of the night sky. I see it. The Nagori have always loved the stars, the Matrix said, her voice distant and reflective. Once, long ago, we worshipped them. Even after we knew what they were, we, they remained our friends. There were many among us who would have gladly gone with the Lord Vader, even without our debt, the joy of traveling among them. I understand, he remembered. Many in the galaxy feel the same way. It's the common birthright of us all. A birthright which we have now lost. Not lost, Leia said, dropping her gaze from the star dish. Only misplaced. She looked over at Calderac and Chewbacca. Perhaps if I talked to all the Nagori leaders at once, what would you say to them? The Matriarch countered. Leia bit her lip. What would she say? That the Empire was using them? That the Nagori perceived it as a debt of honor? That the Empire was pacing the cleanup job so as to keep them on the edge of self-sufficiency without ever reaching it? But at the rate of the decontamination was going, she would be hard-pressed to prove that such lagging, even to herself, that she and the New Republic could give the Nagori back their birthright. But why should they believe her? As you see, Lady Vader, the, matri the Matriarch said into the silence, Perhaps matters will someday change, but until then, your presence here is a danger to us as much as to you. I will honor the pledge of protection made by my third son, and not reveal your presence to our lord, the Great Admiral. But you must leave. Leia took a deep breath. Yes, yeah, she said, the word hurting her throat. She had such hopes for her diplomatic and Jedi skills here. Hopes that those skills, plus the accent of her lineage, would enable her to sweep the Nagori out from under the Empire's fist and bring them over to the New Republic. And now the contest was over, almost before it even begun. What in space was I thinking about when I came here? She wondered bleakly. I will leave, she said aloud, because I don't wish to bring trouble to you or your family. But the day will come, Matrak, when your people will see for themselves what the Empire is doing to them. When this happens, remember that I'll always be ready to assist you. The Matrak bowed low. Perhaps that day will come soon, Lady Vader. I await it, as do others. Leia nodded, forcing a smile. Over before it had begun. But we must make arrangements, too. She broke off as, across the room, the double doors flew open, one of the child door wardens stumbled inside. Matrak, he all but squealed. Mirak Soki, Brakani Virak. Gabrak was on his feet in an instant. Out of the corner of her eye, Leia saw three people stiffen. What is it? she demanded. It is the flying aircraft of our lord, the Grand Admiral, the Matrak said, her face and voice suddenly very tired and very alien. And it is coming here. I never got any voices in this chapter. Sorry, they were all female, except for the children, Whoa. but you didn't want to do that. Whoa. <laughs> Lando told him. Her. Oh, wait. Oh, you're right. It is a... That's a typo. Huh. Told her. Interesting. <laughs> say... All right. Say Lando told him again. We found a typo in the book, you guys. Yeah. He did. That's weird, Lando told her. The main transmitter coil seems to have overloaded and backfed into a dump capacitor. Damaging... Capacitate. Oh yeah, capacitor, you're right, sorry. Dang it! I heard it! I did it! And sorry. then you messed it up! Sorry. Diplomatically, sir, I'm sure it was worthwhile to demonstrate that you care about all of Onogur. 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 There's no I. Dang it! Why can't I get this right? <laughs> Onogur is a stupid name, by the way. It's res it, it's symbolic. Take out Onogur. the... Take out yes. the G and H and it's honor. Okay. But it's wow. Onager. His numbed brain noting vaguely in passing that there are very few people in the galaxy who rated an who rated an atomic surf automatic surf. Oh, atomic. Why do you keep saying atomic? I don't know. His numbed brain noting vaguely in passing that there were very few people in the galaxy who rated an automatic surf from him. <laughs> he even has a T 
irritated at Atomic. Dang it! I see, now you're making me say it. I'll say it again. I'll do it again. Do you want me to do it again?